Stress-Free Cooking is brought to you by From the sunny Mediterranean comes one of the world's finest olive oils for all your cooking needs. Pompeian Extra Virgin Olive Oil, Classic Mediterranean, and Extra Light Tasting. Pompeian makes everything better. From our table to yours, Opeachy Wines. Fine wines and spirits from around the world since 1913. Cutco, the world's finest cutlery. Melissa's, the freshest ideas in produce. And Sub-Zero Wolf Appliances. Welcome to Stress-Free Cooking. I'm Barbara Seelig Brown. I'm here with my guest, Anthony Giglio. And today we are going to put on our bunny slippers, pour several glasses of wine, and cook a great meal. So the menu that I'd like to cook with Anthony today is going to be complemented by several different varietals. But before we get to that, let me tell you a little bit about Anthony. Anthony, welcome to Stress-Free Cooking. Thrilled to be here. Thank you for coming. I met Anthony for the first time at the Aspen Food and Wine Classic and he was just a delight. You were so entertaining but educational and you know what's better than education that has a lot of fun and life to it. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished for the wine wise guy. What I'd really love to hear you tell me about is how you came up with the name wine wise guy. Barbara I have um, pretty much uh, over the past 20 years as a sommelier founded my career on making fun of everything I learned when I became a sommelier because you know, I'm Italian-American, I know you are too. Mm -hmm. We grew up drinking wine in my house as a kid. Um, right. They called it the, sp the spaghetti spritzer, yes. which was <laughs> a tumbler with some ice, uh, a big splash of red you know, jug wine, and then they floated cream soda on top. Um, I grew up taking this for granted, but so many of my friends never had any wine until they snuck it in, oh, you know, yeah, at, at the 16-year-old party at the back of the high school or exactly. something. Exactly, right. I think that's crazy. But we all grew up being kind of mystified by wine, that it's this pretentious European or Eurocentric uh, thing that uh, takes a lot of study. And it's true, if you want to be a professional and work in a restaurant, you need to study to be a sommelier. Other ways, otherwise, you just have to trust your palate. And right. that's what I say, we are red-blooded Americans who have the most opinions. We are, we, I think we're, we're worldly people. We know exactly what we want wherever we go. Um, we can certainly comport ourselves in restaurants. We know how to right. order anything we want. I can't make you eat a rare burger if you like it well done. I can't make you eat a well done steak if you eat it, you know. If no you matter eat it. what the chef says. Exactly. Right. So why should you drink wine that someone else says to drink when you might not like it or you might be afraid of it? I That's say a really drink, good point. Drink, I think Robin Madavi said, drink what you like, like what you drink, and everyone's happy. So Excellent. That's great. That's what I do. Well, before we move on to the wines that we like, would you show me the proper way to open a bottle of wine? Because there are so many different... Sure ways to do that with all the equipment that there is available. There's electric wine openers, there's, you know, this company has some little gadget, but I still like the old-fashioned waiter's course. The waiter's course. I was going to say, most houses I go to, though, they have the, the, uh, the wings. The rabbit thing? No, no, the one that you turn on top <laughs> and the wings, the, the yes. arms rise yeah. and you plunk down. I don't mind them as long as they have what this is called the worm on, the, on, the, on any corkscrew. Mm -hmm. And on those cheap ones, it looks more like a drill bit. And that actually <laughs> literally can drill a hole into the cork. And it cracks it open instead of grabbing it. And does it, cork fall into the wine? It'll get into the wine. Then you have to use a coffee filter. It gets really messy yeah, if you care. Not good. But this is the greatest kind of model ever. The, the waiter's corkscrew. It has a little knife on top, and you use that to cut the foil. A lot of my friends drill right through the foil. Here's what you don't want to do though. If you know, if this is a, a decent bottle of wine, and this isn't plastic, this is actually um, lead, mm -hmm. and it's meant to keep, you know, from tradition, like 200 years ago, to keep vermin from eating the cork out of the bottles when they're in the cellar. I thought it was to keep the air out. 
No, 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 no. This Keep is the vermin out. Okay. Vermin, yeah, because vermin loved. If you're in an old winery in France, you'll see the mice are trying to hop up everywhere and eat cork. Uh, but anyway, you take this and you put it under the lip and you turn. And you can see it actually starts to lift. Mm -hmm. And you do it nice and neat. This is if, you, you know, if, you're, if you're in front of the, uh, the Master Sommelier uh, board that are, they're testing you on this. They you want it to be nice and neat. And it comes right off like that, and you have a nice, neat Very nice. neckline. Right? So the, no chance of cutting yourself. I've seen some ragged jobs where it looks it's like people you, could actually yeah, get hurt. Yeah, because people cut in straight instead of cutting up against the lip. Okay. And then we open this up this way, and you hold the tool this way, right? Hold the bottle this way. I see a lot of people doing all this awkwardness. E easy like this. Boom. In it goes. Let it grab. And all the weight's in this hand, and you just keep turning. Okay. And then you're going to switch the weight. Now, you're right-handed. I am. I'm left-handed. When I do it, it always looks odd. Did you ever notice that when somebody left-handed? Yeah. I never noticed. But here's the other mistake I see. Most people stop somewhere around here. And that's, that's not, not far enough. enough. It's not enough to get the, um, the lever down. So you have to go almost all the way down. So when you get to the last loop, you actually switch the weight. You let go of the bottle, and now it's all in this hand. Oh, Okay. Be careful. You cock it this way. Mm -hmm. This should fit perfectly. Okay. It clicks, and then you just lift. And if you went too far, you just unscrew it one loop. A little bit, right. right. Better to have it gone too far than too then little because you break enough. the cork. Okay. And then most people jack it all the way out. I actually stop and pull it out by hand so you don't break the cork. Oh, very nice. That's it. Okay. And the best part is, of course, we get to drink them, Yes, right, right which okay. is the fun part. So tell me a little bit about the wines that we're going to be drinking today. We have four different wines because we're going to uh, make several different dishes. I'm going to make a soup that has some sausage, some hot sausage in it, some cabbage, some onion, chicken stock and it's going to be topped with cheese. I'm going to do a stuffed chicken breast and the chicken breast is stuffed with ricotta salata which is this salty hard ric dried ricotta uh -huh. um, and that's so that's a whole different flavor profile. So can you tell me a little bit about the wines when that you think we might want? When you sent me the menu I thought I could pair a red or a white with most of these dishes but because my passion goes towards red I figured we could do one fun white that could Compliment a lot of things, but it's the beautiful Gavi, I love which Gavi. is uh, a Piedmont white, um, a really beautiful wine made with the Cortese grape. Um, and then we have two reds. We have a Barbera d'Alba from Alba, which is also Piedmont, and the grape is Barbera. Mm -hmm. And then we have um, a Ripasso Valpolicella, which is um, fans of Amarone will know means yes, it's, it, it's made from those, the, the, the three grapes of um, Corvina, Rondinella, and Molinara. But if you remember Valpolicella, you've got it. And I think a lot of people actually do who drank Reuniti in the 70s will remember Valpolicella as one of the, uh, the disco wines of, the hey, of their heyday, but this is a more serious I probably version. should remember that, but I don't. You don't? <laughs> no. Good for you. So maybe I didn't drink it. That's good. Good for you. That's great. <laughs> but anyway, there are, what do they say? If you remember the 60s, you weren't there. But anyway, let's start cooking. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So we're going to start with our soup. And I know you love to cook, so I'm going to recruit you as a, an assistant if Happy you don't to help. mind. So a little bit of extra virgin olive oil in the bottom of the soup pan, just enough to cover the bottom of the pan. That way we don't overdo it on the olive oil. It's heart healthy, it's really good for us, but it's still calories, so we're going to be careful with that. So just enough to coat the bottom of the pan. Then what I'm going to do is add some onion, and I have a, a medium onion that we've diced up, and it's... Does it matter if you use red or white? Onion? Yeah. I would prefer to use a white onion in this, but quite honestly, my philosophy on cooking is similar to your philosophy on wine. Use what you like or use what you have. I was going to say what you have, right. And okay. I'm a huge fan of keeping my kitchen well stocked so that every time I want to cook, I don't have to go to the store. In fact, on my website, I have a pantry list of things that can help you get through you know, cooking for the week without having to go to the store as often. Okay. So, Anthony, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to slide this over here so we both can reach the pot. Okay. And I'm going to have you add that cabbage. So we're going to saute the onion for a minute or two, add the cabbage. And, you know, I like to cut everything myself because, you know, if you're talking about freshness and flavor, the more you do at the last minute, the better. If you grate the cheese at the last minute, it's going to be more flavorful, it's fresher. But... I also believe in shortcuts for those people that really need right. a shortcut. So if you right. need to buy the cabbage shredded, do that. Right. If that's going to get you in the kitchen, go ahead and do that. So we have onion, we have cabbage. And once this cooks for a minute, I'm going to add that hot Italian sausage. But we're going to just give this a second. Now, this soup was something that my husband and I had when we were visiting Cormier in Italy. Okay. 
So it's a really like hearty dish from the Northern Alps, okay. and uh, it's it could almost be a meal in itself. Have you ever had this type of soup? Never. No, I'm well, interested. We call it in our house Cormier soup, but actually it's really called Zuppa Valpentinese. Okay. <laughs> so it's from that Austro-Hungarian part yep, of Italy. Exactly. Oh, hence the cabbage, which I think throws a lot of people. You know, Fred Potkin took me to Italy about 10 years ago. Oh, really? On a, a tour of, um, of that whole northeastern part of Italy that most Americans don't go to. And we, we, uh, we were blown away by the use of cabbage and coriander and cardamom and all the, you know, the, the spices that you don't think of in Italian food. Well, you know, I'm actually going to do a show this season on that region. Really? Yes. So in this uh, series, there will be a show on the Alto Adige and Southern Tyrol region because I was fortunate enough to go on a trip there myself. So I'm looking forward to doing that show. But I think at this point, what we'll do is add our sausage. And you took it out of the case yourself? I took it out of the case. Some places you can buy it out of the casing. Right. Um, bulk sausage. But I couldn't get that yesterday when I was at the store. So I got. I just took it out of the casing. I just slit the casing and right. zipped it right it out and broke so it up good. into pieces. Now, I'm using a hot sausage because I like things spicy. Okay. But if someone wants to make this and they're not really into the hot, spicy, crushed red pepper, they could use sweet sausage. You know, again, at your kitchen, do whatever you want to do, right? That's it. So we need to let this cook for a few minutes. Um, let's go back. While this is cooking down, why don't we go back and talk a little bit more about the wine. Okay, great. And um, let's, can, we, can we drink it too? Let's taste the wine. Let's do that. <laughs> so I get this question all the time, you know, thanks to people like um, like George Riedel and Max Riedel and, uh, and um, what's the other big fancy Irish company? Um, Waterford. Waterford. You have, you have all these glasses that I get. I see at all the events I go to, and people say, "Do I really need to have a Chardonnay glass, a Cabernet glass, a Pinot Noir glass, etc.?" And I say, "Listen, if you have the space and you are fanatical, absolutely." But right. honestly, if you like to wash glasses. <laughs> exactly. If you like to wash glasses and break them and not cry, um, but the truth is, all you really need is seriously two glasses if you want to be slightly fancy, which is a classic white like this mm -hmm. or a classic tulip shape. Um, and then one that could be a little wider to open up the bouquet in a big red. Right. Although it's some lighter reds like Sangiovese might go well in this. Might be better off in that um, glass. But right. honestly, if, if you know, you're at my grandmother's house, you'd get a juice glass. Right. And it would be perfectly fine as long as the wine is good, the company is good, and the food is good. Exactly. I agree with you 100%. Actually, it's nice to have all those glasses, but you don't have to. And the thing I think is if we're trying to keep this casual, let's not get overly crazy about the glass, right? Exactly right. You know, at my house party, when I have dinner parties, I... Um, I put glasses in front of everyone. I put two glasses. It doesn't even matter if they match, like the whole set to the table. And I put all the wine out at once. And I say, do whatever you want. You want red with the soup? You want white with the soup? I don't care. Good. Have fun. And you'll see people gravitate to what they like, and nobody feels self-conscious. Well, now, do you find people are willing to try new things? I have <laughs> friends where she only drinks Chardonnay, and he only drinks Cab. And they don't care what they're eating or where they are. And they're inflexible, though. I mean, they're so, totally inflexible. So I would hijack them. I would pour my <laughs> wine. Into, I would pour the wine into a decanter, and I would leave the bottle in the kitchen and bring the decanter out and say, "Yeah, it's it's the Chardonnay," and then see what happens when I taste it and see if you could seduce them into trying something new. Okay, that's so the fun of wine, right? It is. Um, so here we have the, again beautiful Gavi di Gavi, um, a classic DOCG Italian wine. Um, smells to me like. Risk minerality, no oak whatsoever. Right, I don't and that's what I'm looking for. I'm not a huge fan of oak. People always say, you know, when they hear you, you know, you read those reviews and they say like, oh, I smell apricots and figs and everything else. Mm. Um, do you smell that? And I say, we all have individual thresholds of, and powers of smell. But what we want, what we hope to have, is at least some uh, fruit in the wine. We want fruit above everything else. Well, it really starts with the fruit. And it, should, it actually should carry yeah. into it. If you smell nothing but like, Butterscotch and toasty, you know, toasty oak. It's that probably is. been way over oaked, um, and that's that's pretty much out of fashion these days. But that was the predominant aromas in the white wines I studied 20 years ago when I became a sommelier. Right. So here I get beautiful crisp minerality, chalky, a slight bit of like maybe acacia flower. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting super geeky. Let's just taste it, shall we? <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Mm. I love the crispy, the minerality, the freshness yeah. and the fruit and and that's what I like in a wine we're looking to balance two things in white wine fruit and acid so when you take another take another sip with me now right and after after we swallow pay attention to the flood that comes across your palate from the sides okay and that's all the, the fruit pouring in and then from front to back acidity wipes your palate clean I call it the Zamboni in wine it comes right <laughs> across and cleans it and every time you take a sip acidity comes in and cleans it out and gets you ready for the next bite of delicious food oh great I 
And there it is. Beautiful mouthwatering at first. Oh, yes. Dries up, the minerality comes in and, and ch it tightens. And I say this to everybody when I taste wine with, with a group of people. If you like this wine by itself, without food, with you'll love it. Quaff into wine, you'll love it with food. But if you don't like it, I beg you to try it with anything with fat. You no know, pretty way to say it. Okay. Anything. It could be potato chips, a piece of cheese, <laughs> your pinky and olive oil, bread and butter, uh, a chip, anything. So taste the wine again. really cleanses your palate. Well, no, it actually adds a nice layer of fat on the palate, and then you taste the wine again, and it tastes completely different, and usually so much better. If you don't like it by itself, it should taste better with food, but if you like it by itself, it'll only be better. I love it. I love okay. it. It's a great wine. That's it is like one do. of my favorite varietals. Right. So I think our soup is coming along. I'm going to add my chicken stock to this now. Homemade chicken stock, whatever favorite brand you have. And we're just going to cook this down for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to put it into these bowls with a nice, hearty, whole grain bread in the bottom of the bowl. Do you toast it, or is it, is it fresh? No, it's actually, it's like a day old. Okay, so my you could toast to do that it, but um, I think day old works just fine. And we always have bread in our house. We always have day old bread in our house. And when you buy really great artisan breads, they yeah. don't last long, right? You know, so especially if you make your own bread, they really don't last long. Do you make your own bread? I do, I do. I love this bread. I didn't make, but I do love to make bread. So what we do need to do one more thing is grate some of that cheese. So I sure. have an Asiago cheese that we're going to put on top of this soup. So while the soup's cooking, I can and have you. Can I cut a piece with the, yes. these knives? Yes. There's plenty of knives. Use whatever one you like. Here's our grater. And we need enough to really um, cover the top of the soup. So we probably need two good chunks like right, that grated. And I guess you could do it right there, OK? Because we are waiting for the soup to cook down. And then we will put the soup in the bowl. We'll put the cheese on top. We're going to pop the soup into the oven for just a couple of minutes until it's nice and golden brown. And then it will be ready. Perfect. While the soup is cooking in the oven, what we'll do is we'll clean up and we'll go on to the next dish and the next wine. The magic of television. Yes, the okay. magic of television. I'm delighted to be here at the beautiful tasting room at Opeachy Wines in New Jersey, where I'm going to be learning lots more about wine and then returning to my kitchen to cook some great dishes. I'm sitting here with Don Opeachy who is the young face of Opeachy Wines. Opeachy Wines is actually right here in New Jersey. Don is fourth generation. His great-grandfather started the company. I'm a huge wine fan, Don. I love it just because it tastes good. I love it because it's sexy and feels good to have a glass of wine nice. in my hand. But I also think that the wine business is very interesting. And it's changed a lot. It's a great, it's a great industry. Um, you know, my family got started in 1913, it was my great-grandfather. Uh, we were distributors in New Jersey out of a small office in Patterson. Ah. Uh, the whole family was in the business. It was my great-grandfather, my great-grandmother, um, and my, uh, my grandfather at the time. And my grandfather was a delivery boy. They used to fill bottles, you know, by hand. Really? Uh, the, you know, so the business has come a long way. I mean, we've been been involved now for over 75 years and um, so my my great-grandfather was quite the entrepreneur um, that's really how we got started in the wine business it was before prohibition ah, um, that's good and he was importing wines from his friends from Italy oh that's how and, he got started yeah, and selling them in okay. New Jersey um, and then you know prohibition kind of put things on hold for a while he got into a lot of different things uh, and then got right back into it when Prohibition Came back to the wine business. Was, was repealed, yeah, and then uh, that was 1934. My, great, uh, my grandfather then joined the business straight out of high school and you know, we've been off to the races ever since. But that's great, and here you are, fourth generation. Yep. So now you're the new fresh face, I guess, of OPG. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so we have quite an array here. So we your do. business we started do. out, I guess, as Italian wine. Yes, we were. Which is still your focus, yes? Yeah, it's still, it's still the majority of, of what we do. But um, you have international we have, wines. Yes, we've definitely branched out. I mean, now we have, we have represented about 50 brands nationally, um, from the majority from Italy, some from Spain, um, France, Argentina, Chile, recently from Hungary. Oh, so wow. uh, we have a nice broad portfolio and you know we represent wineries and other families and their wines in the US. We also create a lot of our own brands 
which I guess you can see some here. Yes, oh, peachy homemade. That's great with peaches, by the way. It's very I've delicious. used it this past summer with peaches. It was great. It's, so. it's a good choice. Now, you've poured something for us to sample. I have. So this, this was a special uh, creation that we came out with a few years back um, for my grandfather. And it's called Zin 91? It's called, yeah, it's called Zin 91. We made as a tribute to him on his 91st birthday. Ah, there's the 91. Uh, yep, so the name, the name says it all. And you know, this was just as an honor to him. I mean, he, basically it was his life's work along with my grandmother to, mm -hmm. to build this business for so many years. And he's 95 now and still, was still in Was Zinfandel one of his favorite wines? It, it's, it's sort of the, um, the classic wine from years ago from California. And we okay. wanted to kind of touch on that when we, when we came up with this. So. Well, I can't thank you enough for sharing this with me. So let's have a toast to you and your grandfather. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm privileged to be here with Giovanni Dinelli. Thank you, Barbara. He's fourth generation in his family of winemaking, and we're going to learn a little bit about Lambrusco today. But I'd also like to learn a little bit, Giovanni, about your family and about how they got into the winemaking business. Yeah, as you said, Barbara, we are a family producer of Lambrusco since fourth generation. Actually, Lambrusco is a wine which grows in our land, which is north of Italy, exactly in the area of Modena and Reggio Emilia. It's a unique wine, it's a fantastic wine because it's a red sparkling, which gives the best when it's semi-sweet. And so red sparkling is a little unusual. It is, it is yeah. really, really. And it's a very important wine for Italy because uh, not everybody knows that Lambrusco is the best seller among the Italian wines all over the world. And it's also the best seller among uh, the Italian wines in Italy which owns actually 15% of the market share. I remember when you were telling me that before, I thought that was so interesting. So you're saying that it's the best seller of Italian wine all over the world. Yes, in, to in volumes, in terms of volumes. And yes. so we're a little bit behind here in this country, so we need to get on the bandwagon, yeah, right? Yeah, we're working on that. Yeah. We're working on yeah, that. We That's are, we great. Are, That's great. That's so interesting. Yes, Lambrusco is a great wine. We've been producing Lambrusco for uh, years. And uh, in the beginning, it was like uh, for the own consumption of the family. You know, we were farmers, so my grand-grandfather was uh, also producing balsamic vinegar, which come from the Aras also, uh, Parmesan cheese, uh, you know, the, we had the pigs for the sliced meat. And then uh, we found ourselves being uh, quite good, probably, doing Lambrusco, so friends were coming by, demanding for more and more, so we started to make oh, a, So your a friends really got you into the winemaking business by coming and asking for your wine. Let's say yes, the demand of the friends. That's yes. great. So your great-grandfather would have started the business. Yes, he did. He did. Oh. He actually, he was doing everything by himself. He was growing and cultivating the, the vineyards. And then he was uh, harvesting, uh, pressing, making the wine, bottling, and then selling as well. And what is your production now? Now we have uh, come out with this new generation of Lambrusco, which is actually a great wine. So we try to give uh, our best, uh, thanks to the experience we have and the new technologies, in order to bring Lambrusco to a new stage. So this is going to be a really a high-end product. It's uh, definitely a very intense uh, tasting experience, very nice. It's a unique product that really everybody should uh, have a taste of. Would you show us the proper way to opening a, open a bottle of sparkling yeah, sure. wine? And there's a method to my madness because then I get to taste this <laughs> wine. And I'd also like to see the color because yeah. from what you've described, the color sounds really the like color, it's going to be beautiful. It is, it is. The color is one of, uh, I mean, uh, of the best part of it because it's really deep, deep intense red ruby with a wonderful foam which uh, in a way is really appearing and uh, it's unique when you see it. I can't wait. So now you're carefully twisting that out yes, of there. Yes, a little bit. Then you can go for the pop, which is nice. And I Everybody like likes the pop. Yeah. Great, great job. And then you just pour it simply like that. You oh, look at the that color. is a beautiful color. And the foam, which is really sexy and appealing. It is beautiful. What a gorgeous color. I'd really like to have a carpet that color. Yeah, the color <laughs> actually suggests you what the wine is going to be. So very full and intense with a very nice fruit in. It's a little bit spicy, very long-lasting, nice acidity. Mm. It has so a wonderful really, nose. Yeah. Mm. How's it? Uh, it's fabulous. It's really great. I, you know what I really love? love? 
the bubbles. When I first take a taste, I really get the bubbles and the, the fun and the effervescence. Yeah, it, it's very friendly. It's very easy to drink, but in the same time, it's a great experience. Really. It is a great experience and very fruity, like you said. Very fruity, and it matches any kind of food. So you can have it with uh, ethnic food, Italian food, obviously. You can right. have it as an aperitif. You can have it uh, any time. And definitely. also, maybe, you know, after a hard day's work with a nice antipasto, oh, yes, really. you know, a nice little uh, sample of antipasto and a nice glass of wine. It's a great Make matching. you relax. It is, right. You are trying to improve the quality of the Lambrusco, yes. which means that you're also changing the face of Lambrusco, I think? Yes, uh, we are trying to uh, start from the very beginning of the process. So basically the research uh, starts in uh, the vineyards where we try to grow the grapes at uh, their best potential. We have uh, an end picking, selecting the very best grapes uh, on the vines, and then we have uh, a soft crushing uh, for only the 40% of the potential of the grapes. So it's really a nectar that comes out of it. And then we have a very slow fermentation in stainless steel tank, and um, that's why we have these very nice perfumes, long lasting, nice aroma. Yes, because of the steel tanks. Yes. That's great. And how many bottles do you produce? So far, for this great variety, the Reggiano DOC, we are having 50,000 bottles per year. So it's a, a new product. We are planting new wines, so we'll be producing more very soon. For this one, we are having around 200,000 bottles per year. Oh, great. And one of these bottles is very special. Yes, you're right. This one is a very special bottle because uh, it's a designer's bottle. Actually, it was uh, designed expressly for the company and for my father in particular by Mr. Sergio Scaglietti. Giovanni, it's been so kind of you to join me, and it's been delicious, it's been fun, and very educational. I can't thank you enough. I hope that you'll come to Stress-Free Cooking again. Thank you very much for inviting me, Barbara. My pleasure. Let's get the soup in the bowl, top it with the cheese, and we'll put it in the oven, okay? So oh, we want this soup so nice good. and thick. It smells amazing. It really is a great what soup. When did they invent the TV that you could actually get like, you push the button and the smell comes out? I know. Out. That'd be great. I know. Wouldn't that be great? We also need that on Facebook because we're always putting our food pictures on <laughs> Facebook. Do you have a fan, a fan page, Barbara? I do. Stress Free Cooking with host Barbara Selig Brown. And I know you're one of my fans. I am a fan. I just was, I was egging you on there for a pop. <laughs> I, I just I just started a fan page that I have like three people on there. So. Oh well, I will be your fan. Okay, thank okay. you. So thank let's you. get some of this cheese on. Okay, nice clean hands. Your hands are your best kitchen tools. Okay. Okay, so get lots of cheese on there. And then we're gonna put it in the oven and melt it. It's going right into the oven. It will melt. It'll be golden. It'll be so good. So it'll be yummy. All right, let me get this in the oven. We'll come back. We'll go on to the next dish. Anthony, what I'd like to do is make this chicken dish that my mother came up with, and it was really delicious. It uses ricotta salata, which, as we said before, is a dried, salted ricotta. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to grate that because it is hard. It's not soft and creamy like what most people are used to. We have some fresh basil leaves from my patio, some fresh parsley, breadcrumbs, and some minced garlic. I'm just going to start with my chicken breast, and I'm going to cut a pocket in these chicken breasts. Um, and so what I'm going to do is just hold my hand on the fattest part of the chicken breast, take a knife, just stick it inside, and I'm just going to cut a nice little pocket in there so I'm not going to be bothered with flattening, pounding, rolling, stuffing, right. and worrying about things oozing out. Okay? <laughs> so while I'm doing this, would you mind grating about half of that ricotta? Sure. Please? Sure, sure. While we're doing that, can we talk a little bit about the wine that you recommend for this? Um, I, I've been thinking about this because you sent me these recipes ahead of time and I thought um, because I love red wine with everything and most people would look at chicken and say white wine. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really what's with the chicken, isn't it? Sure, sure. But I think that a lot of people just default chicken equals, you know, white meat equals white wine. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love red wine with every dish, even, even what you would have the whitest wine with, I would put red probably. Okay. But uh, I would say um, we're looking for something medium bodied here, nothing to clobber you. I'm not looking for a lot of oak. Um, okay. So I would say like a beautiful Barbera d'Alba from Piedmont where the wines are inherently acidic, food friendly, um, delicious and refreshing, but not really, really heavy in, in the, uh, the tannic spectrum or in the oak spectrum. So this is going to be a really nice wine. And this is a lighter red as opposed to one of those really right. big reds. It's from the same territory as Barolo, but not nearly as, as, yeah, big. as powerful and as And we Barolo. don't need that big Barolo glass for this. No, that's for your brisket. That's for my brisket. Yeah, okay, have, from one, another show. Yes. All right, while you're doing that, I'm going to wash my hands. Be right back.
How's that cheese look? Beautiful. Good. All right. Nice I'm going to switch my cutting board also. You know, Barbara, in Sicily, where my wife's family is from in Messina, they actually have um, a ricotta that they bake. Um, and even though around Italy everyone has a version of baked ricotta, nobody makes it like they do in Messina province where it's actually the color of caramel oh. after three days in the oven. That sounds um, three days? They put it in and out three times and it shrinks from 14 pounds to about five. 14 pounds? So 14 they start pounds. with a lot. They start with a lot of ricotta and it goes down to this little tiny disc about the circumference of this bowl. Oh my God. And when you cut into it, it's completely caramel. And, and your mother-in-law brought that back? She sneaks it in the suitcase. In her underwear. It, yes, exactly. <laughs> and um, they grate it over pasta and it melts like lava over red sauce. Oh, that sounds fabulous. So you are so lucky to have that. I'm very lucky. All right, great. That looks wonderful. So now all we're going to do is add the basil and parsley and garlic to the cheese. Maybe half those breadcrumbs are going to go in there. Should I do it? Yeah, that'd be great. I know you love to cook. I do. I've never been trained, but I had two great grandmothers who cooked well. Thank you. That looks good. Okay. Can, can I pour you a glass of wine? Please. I thought you'd never ask. So I'm going to stuff my chicken breast while you are pouring the wine. Then we'll get this into a pan with some extra virgin olive oil and saute these. Probably a lot of people ask me, um, when you're switching from one red to the next, so say we had this wine followed by another bigger red, like, like, like a Barolo we mentioned, um, should we switch glasses? I, I feel like you should do whatever you want, but what I would <laughs> never do is rinse the glass with water. So I think the best rinse for a glass is wine. It is wine, so okay. So just move from one to the next. And what if somebody doesn't want to waste good wine with a rinse? Because that might happen. No, I, when, I, when I say rinse, I mean... Oh, you mean <laughs> pour it in there pour and drink it. Pour it in there and it. drink it. That's okay. the best rinse. So pour in a little bit, drink it, yeah, and then around, pour drink in it. a yeah. right-sized portion. Talk to me a little bit about the right amount of wine to pour in the glass. So if you notice, every, every great wine glass on a stem um, is made the same way where you have um, the curve from underneath from the stem and then it straightens out. Mm -hmm. That breaking point is almost universally... The where? same on all glasses, even though the glass may be really fat or really tall and thin. Where it breaks is where you're supposed to stop, and that's usually three ounces. Oh, I never knew that they were always about three ounces. They're, it's amazing that it works out that way. And you could pour, you, and you could, you could, you could portion, a portion wine by counting the ounces or just knowing where the breaking point is and, right. and moving around the table. But most people pour because they think it's a, like at a restaurant where they pour by the glass and they go up to here. Right. And you'll only get maybe four or five glasses out of the bottle, and at a dinner party for eight, that's a problem. Right. So always count to three or stop at the curve where right. it straightens out, and you'll get around the table. Great. Oh, that's really good information. So, I'm just going to wash my hand again okay. because we've got chicken. We're okay. going to saute this on one side, turn it over, add some wine to the dish, cook it about ten minutes. It will be done. And then we're going to eat? Then we're going to eat. Terrific. Anthony, I think our chicken could probably be turned. It smells ready. We want it nice and golden brown. Beautiful. One other little tip when we're cooking, if we're reading a recipe and it says cook two to three minutes or until golden, don't worry about the two to three minutes, do the golden part. Okay. Okay? So we have that turned over. Let's let it cook a little bit on this side and then we're going to add a nice big splash of red wine, cook it down about ten minutes. It'll be ready to eat. Perfect. But the one thing that I would add to this menu would be a salad. And I know salads are really hard to pair wine with. You're throwing down the gauntlet here. Yes. <laughs> so if I were to do a salad with a red wine and extra virgin olive oil dressing, what would you recommend? Now, would we think about the other dishes or just about the salad? Uh, I tend to extend whatever we're drinking with the other courses into the salad course and okay. hope for the best. Because it's really... It's Salad really, is hard. It's the vinegar. Yeah, it's the vinegar, because the, the vinegar, vinegar. Will, will pretty much corrupt anything you try and pair it with. But I think the more powerful the red wine, the better the chance it has to stand up to vinegar. Now, I've heard other wine experts talk about white with salad, but yeah. you... I think what you're saying about a big red with I would, salad. I would do big red with salad. I don't care. I like that. I, because I, especially if you're having the salad after the main course. Right, because that's how we eat. Italians eat right. salad at the end to cleanse Ex the palate before dessert. Right. And so, so you've had red with the main course, perhaps? Yeah. I'd extend it straight through. So you, if, we, for instance, we went from Barbera, moved up to a, Bar a Barolo or a Brunello or a big Cabernet, and then I would put that with the salad course and hope for the best. Okay. So we have our red wine in here. It's going to deglaze the pan. We like all those bits that are on the bottom of the pan. That's called the fawn. That's going to create our sauce. I'm going to turn this down to simmer. Here's our soup. When that came out of the oven bubbling, it was so beautiful. I love it. And really, that's all you have to do is cook it until it bubbles. That'll be enough to melt the cheese. 
This could be a great lunch with a salad as well as part of our meal tonight. Let me grab a spoon and see if we can get a taste of that. Spoon for you? I'll move this a little closer to us. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. I'll let you go first. I've had this before, so I'm going to let you do the I tasting. I see that sausage. Sausage, I cabbage, see cheese. We have chicken stock. You could use uh, any stock that you have, really. Just be careful. It might be really, really hot. Mmm. Do you like it? Mouth it's is delicious. Sweet. It's hard to speak with a it's full mouth, isn't and it? I love the heat in there too, because I'm a, I'm a spicy guy. You're a spicy guy. I knew that. I knew you liked spicy and, and foods. The, um, so and the, the cabbage is, is delicious. It's, it's it really is interesting how those go together, isn't it? Yeah, I love it. Well, Anthony, I just can't thank you enough for coming to be my guest on Stress Free Cooking. Mwah. I hope you'll come again sometime I'll, when your schedule permits. I feel really I'll lucky back. I that I back. got you today because <laughs> I know that your schedule has been so insane. Thanks for putting up with my crazy schedule, by well, the way. Well, Wine Wise Guy, AnthonyGilio.com. Thank you so much. You've taught me a lot. I hope my viewers have enjoyed it. Please check my website, StressFreeCooking.com, for some recipes and great tips on wine and links to my friends like Anthony Gilio. Thanks Thank again for coming. Cheers. Stress Free Cooking is brought to you by From the sunny Mediterranean comes one of the world's finest olive oils for all your cooking needs Pompeian extra virgin olive oil, classic Mediterranean, and extra light tasting Pompeian makes everything better From our table to yours, Opeachy Wines Fine wines and spirits from around the world since 1913Enjoy Barbara Selig Brown's cookbook as she shows you how to make stress-free dishes in the comfort of your own home. Offer made by Stress-Free Cooking.